Good evening, everyone. This on? Good evening, everyone. Good evening. So, okay, as you get your last little snick snack and drink, I will welcome you to the last Grand Homes and Gardens lecture of this series. It's been a fun run down the coast, and we're ending up in South Florida tonight at Vizcaya. But we, I am particularly delighted to uh, welcome Nick Lopez here tonight from Keller Williams Princeton, who is our sponsor for the evening. So I am going to be brief um, and just say welcome and have Nick come and welcome you as well. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. So again, my name is Nick Lopez of Keller Williams Princeton. Um, I can't say don't even have the words for how delighted I am that we're able to sponsor this. This is actually our second year. Um, Morvin is an amazing institution. You know, it's a fundamental part of the community. As a realtor, when it comes to homes, this is kind of my ball of wax. Uh, and again, being able to be a part, we just had our 20 year anniversary for my brokerage. Um, so to be able to be a part of this, I grew up in the area, went to Westminster Youth Corral as a kid, uh, graduated Westminster Plainsboro. Um, it's just fantastic to be able to help support. I've brought my kids to the museum. They love it. Uh, to be able to continue this across the board and then learn about some amazing homes that we've seen through history is just fantastic. So thank you for all of your support. Thank you for being here and thank you for letting us be a part of your journey. So let's have a great time. Thank you. very much, Nick. You're, you're very kind to have Keller Williams uh, sponsor tonight's lecture, and we're very grateful. And uh, you're a great community partner, so we're, it's wonderful to have you aboard. And welcome, everyone, and good evening. And as Jill said, this is our final in our four series of four, but I'm so glad you have been able to join us, and we'll make this brief trip to Miami as we gaze ever hopeful towards spring. Um, this, grand, this uh, grand property that we're featuring tonight is fascinating and beautiful. It's called Vizcaya. The background materials mention that Vizcaya was, in its time, like Morvan is, was in its time, considered a cultural hub and was known to host dignitaries and celebrities of the day. It is interesting to note that right from our country's foundation, successful, innovative individuals have had a tendency to dream and dream big and plan and, and innovate extravagantly to expand the possibilities for the future. Tonight, we will learn about Mr. Deering's visions and efforts to bring his dream to reality. If you've been with us for our whole series, thank you very much. We hope you've had as much fun as we have had. And uh, we thank you for your support. And we hope you'll join us again next year. If this evening's program is a new experience for you, it should entice you to come back to Morven often and to join us as members if you're not already. You can take part in all our varied and intriguing programs, thanks to our curator, Debbie Lambert Redman, and activities and bring family and friends. We look forward to seeing you often. We thank you for being here this evening. And um, now the glory of vintage Miami awaits us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liza. Uh, and thank you, everyone. I'm Debbie Lampert Rudman, Curator of Education and Public Programs at Morven Museum and Garden. And I am delighted and honored to welcome Remco Jansonius. There he is. This guy is Senior Director of Art and Artifact Stewardship. Remco was formerly the Deputy Director of Collections and Curatorial Affairs and has enjoyed a distinguished and award-winning 17-year career with Vizcaya. Tonight, Remco will share with us the secrets of Vizcaya, a most unusual American house, as he has titled it. So mix or swill your mojito, <laughs> and we'll find out why we're drinking them tonight in just a little while, and sit back and enjoy our cruise along the shores of Miami's Biscayne Bay as we approach the finale of our 2002 Grand Tour. Thank you, Remco. 
Thank you, Debbie, for that uh, introduction. And um, thank you also to Morven Museum and Garden for inviting me to be part of this very uh, interesting series. It's uh, an interesting series, but it's also a fun series. After all, you know, how often do you get invited to give a talk and you get to propose what the guests are drinking? So I hope that you all have a mojito in front of you. And uh, you may have been wondering why it is that I proposed uh, the mojito as the cocktail du soir. Um, and you may think, well, this guy is in Miami. Miami has this large Cuban American population. Uh, rum is a very Cuban liquor. So there you are, the mojito. Well, all that may be true, but that's not really the reason that I proposed this drink. But um, I'm not going to give that away just yet, so you have to sit this through. I'm first going to talk a little bit about James Deering. And let me start my thing here. Hold on. <laughs> Can you see this all right? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, James Deering, about his background, um, his family, and um, minor detail, what the uh, source of the wealth was that built Vizcaya. So James Edward Deering was born in 1859 in South Paris, Maine. And that's where his father, William Deering, started a business manufacturing agricultural equipment. It was a successful business, and his, um, he employed his two sons, Charles and James, and they eventually founded the Deering Manufacturing Company. This was very successful also, and um, as it turned out, they were competing with another company, the McCormick Harvesting Machine Company. And this competition was uh, quite fierce until the House of Morgan um, engineered a merger between the two companies. This was in 1902. And this was a merger between the Deering Company, the McCormick Company, and several smaller companies. And this, um, here in this, Image here, you see so not seeing your screen yet, Franco. Um, oh, hold on, hold on. Let me hold on. How is there? We go. I am so sorry. That's fine. And if you could just go ahead and uh, start the presentation. Yeah. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. So it's only been, what, two years since we've been doing this, and it still keeps happening, right? <laughs> and it's very brilliant. So, um, Vizcaya, I, uh, I hope you have a mojito, and I'm going to be talking about James Deering. Uh, I showed this before. So uh, James Deering, um, his father, William Deering, uh, started this business in South Paris, Maine. He, um, he employed his son, James, sons, James and Charles. And uh, these are some advertisements of various iterations of the Daring Company. There are fun uh, collector's items, uh, postcards, and um, also of the much later Daring Company. So um, this company was competing with um, the, McC uh, the McCormick Harvesting Machine Company, the House of Morgan, um, engineered a mer merger in 1902, and this resulted in International Harvester. This company was uh, headquartered in Chicago and had a number of plants around the country. And when you look at the images of these factories, they're just humongous factories, and they're putting out so much uh, equipment for, as the name already suggests, both, both the uh, domestic and, and the international markets. Mind you, and this is something that Debbie and I uh, briefly spoke about yesterday, there may be some confusion between 
James Deering and John Deere. And uh, this is understandable considering that both men were involved in the uh, manufacturing of agricultural equipment. But uh, International Harvester uh, is still, exists still in, in some way or another, sometimes under another name, but it's really the John Deere company that is uh, most known to this day. So anyway, our man, James Deering, became the vice president of International Harvester. And um, while uh, in that role, he, uh, he uh, was in charge of innovation, uh, staying ahead of the competition. He also traveled a lot and he, um, he worked abroad, representing and promoting the company. So he traveled indeed widely and uh, he was quite a public figure. He played an important role in various international relations and he was very much a Francophile. At one, at one point he received the uh, Legion of Honor from the French government for his role in, um, in advancing relations between France and the US. He had a house in France uh, in Neuilly-sur-Seine, and um, that's just, just outside of Paris. And that's where he mingled with uh, the international elite. And that's somewhat illustrated by this pamphlet. This is the uh, 1923 yearbook of the Inter-Allied Union. This was an organization that was founded in 1917 to promote um, rela international relationships just after the conclusion of World War I. And uh, on the middle page, when you see the names, I don't know if you can read it there, but uh, those are the honorary members, including General Pershing, Marshall Douglas Ake of uh, Douglas Ake, uh, Marshall Pétain. And then uh, further in the pamphlet, there are the names of the members, and you see uh, James Deering at his address in Neuilly. So um, Deering retreated from International Harvester in 1908. He didn't really um, retire. That was not until another 10 years. But he uh, slowed down because of his health. And uh, at doctor's advice, he started to look around for warmer climates. Um, at the time, so he had a house in Paris. He also had a house in um, unfashionable Lakeshore Drive in Chicago, uh, a house in Evanston, just outside of Chicago, and an apartment in New York. So it's clear that he had made his fortune through uh, International Harvester. So he started looking around to build a winter estate, and he considered a number of places, including Egypt, where he had been, um, France, Italy, Spain. Um, he considered California also, but ultimately he settled on South Florida. But he did not opt for the Palm Beach area. Um, there was already a, uh, um, a scene of uh, the rich and famous spending winters there. And there was also um, Henry Flagler's Whitehall. And I think you've heard about this estate in a, in a previous uh, season at Morven. But uh, instead, Deering went for South Florida and specifically Coconut Grove, immediately to the south of Miami. Um, his father, William, and his brother, Charles, already had some property there. They, they spent time of the uh, part of the year there. And um, while Deering was younger and he lived in Chicago and then also in Paris, he was certainly part of a social scene and um, he attended and threw big parties. Uh, the uh, social pages of the Times uh, certainly speak, um, speak volumes to that. But as he retreated to South Florida, that was just not really his frame of mind anymore. So this is what uh, Miami looked like in 1896. That's the year that the city was incorporated. So it didn't quite have the scene that the uh, cities up north would, would have at that same time. So in 1910, Deering started to buy land, and eventually this amounted to um, 180 acres of Bayfront property in Miami. 
He paid as much as $1,000 per acre. And in um, a letter I also read, he mentioned $2 per linear foot of Bayfront property. So you can only imagine what that might cost today. But the land at the time was, sorry, was made up of mangroves, um, native hardwood hammock, pineland, swamp. It was infested with alligators, snakes, mosquitoes. So um, it's clear that at the time, the, the, in these photos show it, the land that he selected was uh, really still kind of a wilderness. Anyway, with the site selected, Deering uh, needed to put together a team to realize his dreams. And enter these three men from left to right, Francis Barral Hoffman Jr., the architect, Diego Suarez, the landscape architect, and Paul Chalfin, the chief designer. Now, the two architects were young with limited experience, and um, that was for a reason. Uh, one of Deering's nieces, who um, had, together with her, her sister, had inherited the estate, she stated in a 1950s interview that Deering and Chalfin had wanted a young architect, uh, someone with less experience. That way, the architect would design rather what they wanted rather than what he himself wanted. And that approach really seems to have worked for Vizcaya. So how did the team come together? Once uh, the, the site was selected, he approached several people to find just the right person to be his right hand. And he first approached Elsie the Wolf. She was an interior decorator, very successful. Her first job had been at the invitation of Stanford White to decorate the Colony Club in uh, New York City, a, a women-only club. And um, as a result of this job, she quickly developed a um, um, very high-class clientele around the country. And among these clients was indeed James Deering. She, uh, he had hired Elsie to decorate his house on uh, Lakeshore Drive in Chicago. And Elsie had an assistant working for her by the name of Paul Chalfin. And uh, to make a long story short, that is really how Paul Chalfin and James Deering met. Now, uh, Paul Chalfin was quite a character. Uh, in Vizcaya, an American villa and its makers, Witold Rybzinski, one of the two co-authors, describes him as follows, and I quote, in his mid-30s, very self-confident, something of a dandy, affected in manner and speech, and openly homosexual, end of quote. So Chalfin had done a lot before uh, the Vizcaya job. He had studied at Harvard, um, at the Art Students League in New York, also at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris. Uh, he had studied painting with Jean-Léon Jean Jean Leon Jérôme and James McNeil Whistler. He worked for a brief while as curator of Asian art at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And at one point, he also received a, a scholarship to be at the American Academy in Rome. And this really allowed him to travel extensively in Europe and especially in Italy. But in spite of all this experience, um, his intended career as a painter really never took off. But yet, to Deering, this multifaceted experience, uh, experience, it was just what he was looking for. So he invited Chalfin to join him on a trip to Europe uh, as a sort of uh, artistic advisor. So a relationship began between James Deering and Paul Chalfin. A relationship that for us today is um, fascinating, it's complex, and it's also somewhat mysterious. 
on the one hand, we have James Deering, um, the, the man who wanted to build um, a house and a home in the subtropics, a man who would remain a lifelong bachelor. And on the other hand, we had Paul Chalfin, um, the painter, the curator, the uh, designer, the artist, a man who for the duration of the Vizcaya project would live uh, with his boyfriend on a houseboat moored near Vizcaya. Uh, he was the man who saw Vizcaya as his chance to create something spectacular and to uh, leave his mark. So for Talvin, the sky was the limit. And for Deering, well, um, he had to pay the bills. And um, Fiskai has extensive archives that document the creation of, uh, of, of the estate, from early design to furnishing. And there are numerous letters and telegrams between Chalfin and Deering, as one was in Miami, the other one was in New York or in Chicago or in Paris or en route on a ship to somewhere. And, um, and in these letters, we read numerous times how Deering is worried about the cost of the project, and he's frustrated about the timeline of the project. Mind you, the, um, the house itself was built between 1914 and 1916, but the gardens were not completed until 1922. And another point of uh, frustration and of uh, ongoing disagreement was uh, the question, what was going to be the emblem of the house? On numerous occasions, uh, Deering had stated that he wanted it to be the, the caravel, the, uh, the ship, uh, the symbol of the age of exploration, which was a particular interest of his. But Chalfin, he went for the seahorse. So um, when you see... That's, that's not Chalfin uh, hanging on the uh, wind vane, though. But uh, when you read the telegram, uh, Deering writes to Paul Chalfin, have counted today 13 seahorses at and four house and one caravel. Well, that's probably uh, an understatement of, of his uh, frustration, but there are numerous such letters that, that address this same issue. Now, they also traveled together numerous times to Europe on buying trips to get um, antique furniture, art objects to furnish the house. And here we see another side of uh, their relationship. Now, Deering was definitely not the art connoisseur or the art collector. It was really Chalfin who brought that expertise to the table. But then in the 1956 interview, Chalfin is quoted as saying that traveling with Deering was, and I quote, like taking around a child who knew very little and got tired easily. <laughs> so enough about that. Um, we're going to move on to uh, the next, the second member of the team. Francis Ural Hoffman Jr. So with the authorization of Deering, Chalfin hired um, uh, Ural Hoffman in 1912. Uh, Hoffman too had studied at Harvard uh, and at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris. He had worked at the architectural firm of Career and Hastings. And in 1909, he started his own firm in New York. Um, there are many letters between uh, James Deering and Hoffman, uh, and they kind of show how Deering was really intimately involved in many details of the project. But over the course of the project, there were numerous disagreements between Hoffman and Chalfin. Uh, they resulted eventually in, con in Hoffman's contract being terminated in 1917, and Hoffman left for Europe to, jo to join the war effort. But that's not really where the disagreement ended. In um, a New York Times article in 1953, that was um, a, a little while after the uh, Vizcaya had opened as a public art museum. In this article, um, 
Chalfin is quoted as saying about Vizcaya, Hoffman did the plumbing, I did the house. Now, this was obviously not true. And um, Hoffman uh, threatened the New York Times with a lawsuit. And as a result, a few months later, uh, the article on the right, the New York Times posted a uh, retraction of the article. And the third member of the team is Diego Suarez. Um, in the um, spring of 1914, um, Chalfin and Deering were traveling to, um, to Italy and they visited with Arthur Acton at his uh, Villa La Pietra in Florence. And that's where they met Di Diego Suarez for the first time. Uh, Diego Suarez, a Colombian architect. His father was Italian and his mother was Colombian. So uh, Suarez took Deering and Chalfin around Florence, showing them uh, various houses and various villas and gardens. And that had a major impact on what Vizcaya would eventually become, especially the gardens. But in the, and in the fall of 1914, Suarez traveled to, um, uh, on his way to Colombia. He stopped in New York and he got stranded there because World War I had just started. Um, that's where he met Chalfin again, and Chalfin offered him the job to design the gardens of Vizcaya. Uh, in New York, um, Suarez got started on the job right away, even before um, setting foot on the property. Um, he did a tremendous job. This is a, a very early drawing by Suarez of the formal gardens. And uh, a number of changes were made, but it's still uh, the way it is today that this is basically the layout of the gardens. But this ended on a somewhat of a bitter note as well. Um, Suarez got demoted from being the landscape architect to uh, being an employee in Chalfin's office. So this too kind of illustrates that the, um, the relationship between um, uh, the members of the design team was not exactly without strife or troubles. So as I mentioned, there is uh, extensive correspondence between Deering um, and the three members of the design team, but also with uh, to and from contractors, dealers, uh, the, the site superintendent, etc. But these are all letters that deal with the um, with Vizcaya, with the construction of Vizcaya. Uh, there are no; it, it's all business related. There are not really any personal letters, and as a result, we we know very little about Daring as a person. But that changed a little bit about uh, eight years ago. We received a, a gift of a manuscript. Um, that was written by Althea Altimus, a young single mother who had served for some years as Deering's personal secretary at Vizcaya. And in this manuscript, Altimus writes about her experience working for several big bosses in Miami, uh, in Miami, in Chicago, uh, Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. Now, the names of these bosses are thinly veiled and uh, quickly discoverable, but also we uh, realized that the things that she wrote about Vizcaya were very much based on fact. And this is how we learned a little bit more about James Deering and about life at Vizcaya. She writes about um, a number of high-profile visitors to Vizcaya, including uh, Marion Davies, the, um, the Ziegfeld girl and actress, uh, Glenn Curtis, the aviator, William Jennings Bryant, the politician, and the Miami, um, the South Florida real estate promoter, and uh, the artist John Singer Sargent. <clears throat> Sorry. So um, this manuscript was annotated by Robin Backin. She is a associate professor of history at the University of Miami. And she placed the, the manuscript in the context of um, Jazz Age America and um, working women in early 20th century America. 
between the manuscript itself, which is entirely uh, uh, published in this in this publication, this book, and um, Bakin's annotations, it, it really makes for an excellent read. And um, I still like to think that at one point this is going to be a movie. <laughs> so um, we're going to visit the house, but before we do that, I'm going to make a few comments about design. So um, Deering had traveled extensively in Europe. Uh, he had made a number of trips to Spain also. And in this image, you see the, um, the Spanish artist Ramon Casas and uh, Charles Deering, James' brother. Ramon Casas was a close friend of Charles. And we see James and on the other side of the car, the uh, two valets of uh, James and Charles. This was in around 1910 in Spain. So uh, Deering, James Deering had fallen in love with Sevilla. And for a while, it, it looked like uh, Deering's house in South Florida would be in the Spanish style. But um, that all changed. Um, Deering and Chalfin were traveling in northern, uh, northern Italy and they came upon this villa, Villa Rezzonico in Bassano del Grappa in um, the Veneto region of Northern Italy. So um, this was built in the uh, late 17th century and eventually this house um, stood modeled at least the exterior for the design of Vizcaya. And when you look at this architectural drawing and the photo of Villa Rezzonico and of Vizcaya, um, you see the um, overpowering towers, the uh, undec undecorated the severe windows and the plain plaster walls. So um, as Deering traveled through Europe, they purchased these uh, decorative arts furnishings and all of this was uh, documented extensively in the so-called purchase ledger cards that uh, Chalfin created. On the left here, you see uh, a wood mantle, uh, Georgian carved English mid 18th century, bought from a dealer, in this case, a dealer in New York, Carl Freund, on Octo in October 1913 for $575. Uh, and this was placed in Salon A, which eventually would become, uh, would be called the Galeon Room. On the right side, there is this partly gilt walnut table, Italian mid, uh, mid 16th century, has unicorns of the Farnese family for supports from Naples, bought from the dealer E. Canessa in Paris in uh, 1913, and it was placed in the living room. So uh, besides the correspondence that I've mentioned, these purchase ledger cards also provide great information about the whole Vizcaya project. Now, so uh, with this image, I think we're getting closer to um, to the mojito also. Um, but all this, the construction materials and the uh, art objects were shipped to uh, Vizcaya by boat. And um, in the top left photo, you see the schooner moored at Vizcaya and in front of it are all the, these rows of uh, roof tiles. These are the, um, the handmade tiles that Deering bought in Cuba and that in the next couple of years would end up. This, this photo, by the way, is dated 1914. So these uh, roof tiles would end up on the roof of the, the main house and other buildings at Vizcaya. But um, that's not all that arrived by boat. Um, according to correspondence, in 1915, another schooner sailed for Vizcaya. And the bill of lading stated that the cargo consisted of 110 tons of marble. Uh, these were the statues for the gardens, as you see in the lower photo, along with 779 cases of household effects. And these were actually bottles of liquor. <laughs> Mind you, this was uh, 1915. 
and uh, prohibition in Miami had already gone in, into effect in 1913. So Miami was dry before the rest of the country was dry. So um, Deering just wanted to make sure that he, he kind of saw what was going to happen. Um, and he wanted to make sure that his house would be well stocked with liquor for his guests and for himself before the Volstead Act, uh, the National Prohibition Act, would uh, go into effect, which was in 1920. So basically, Deering took the risk and he basically smuggled the liquor into safe storage in the basement of his house, even before he moved in or even before the house was finished. And so this is why I proposed Mojito as the uh, drink tonight. With prohibition in full force, many Americans went to Havana, Cuba uh, to have a good time, but and they could have their share of cocktails there, including Mojitos. But also, so this was part of the prohibition era of the time. But also, uh, the top right is one of the pages of Altimus's manuscript, Big Bosses. Altimus writes about meeting Bill McCoy. He was a notorious rum runner during prohibition, but he was also known to deliver quality liquor, as in not watered down. And that's where the expression comes from, the real McCoy. So uh, there you have it. I hope that you're enjoying your mojito. And I hope, uh, Debbie probably knows more about this, but I hope it was made with the real McCoy. <laughs> so now we are uh, finally going to the house. Or we're approaching the house. <laughs> Um, there is a piazza as you approach the house with several sculptures. And one of the sculptures is of um, Ponce de Leon, a, uh, an early Spanish explorer who landed on the shores of Florida in 1513. And you see him there in the, the piazza, the right photo. Uh, in the left photo, the sculpture on the left is uh, that very sculpture. However, it is, as is written on the purchase ledger card, it's a sculpture of uh, Gian Lorenzo Bernini, the sculptor. So uh, what happened? This uh, 18th century sculpture, um, Chalfin removed the, um, the bust of a man that you see in the Bernini sculpture at his foot, and he replaced it with a globe and he changed the name of the sculpture. And I don't know if you can read it there, but uh, here is written Ponce de Leon. So with this alteration, Chalfin was able to give expression to Deering's interest in the age of exploration. And that's something that would return uh, on a number of occasions throughout the design of Vizcaya. But also with, this, with these sculptures, with this, these changes, um, they set a tone for Vizcaya as being all about storytelling and myth-making. Of course, there are a lot of um, objects at Vizcaya that have great art historical value in their own undiluted uh, way. But then there are also objects that have been altered, like this one, and um, that have just an added layer of value through storytelling and myth-making. And indeed, this sculpture of Ponce de Leon, or, or really Bernini, is a great example of that. So we are really going to the house now. <laughs> So when you enter the house, the entrance loggia, you are greeted by this sculpture of uh, Bacchus, the god of wine and hospitality. It's uh, made up of fragments of different sculptures. Part of it is 2nd century AD. Uh, some of it is 17th century. 
Then you have these two putty flanking backers. Uh, they are riding some mythical uh, seahorse dolphin type of creature. They are from a different era, from a different um, uh, location. Then below that is the marble basin that is uh, second century AD. And below that is uh, a black marble floor basin that was designed by Chal Chalfin. So uh, this was definitely one of Chalfin's fortes to bring very disparate objects together and to create a very uh, imposing ensemble. And we keep seeing that in different places at Vizcaya. Um, we're going to go on to the uh, reception room um, with a French 18th century interior. And one of the most interesting elements in this room are the, the silk wall panels. They show uh, stylish palm trees with birds and butterflies fluttering around them. Um, but what you see today in this room is, um, is a, a very accurate replica by the firm Scalamandre. They were made in 1966. But when Darian Chalfin purchased these uh, wall silks from the, um, the, the, the original ones, from the dealer um, Dino Barozzi in Venice in 1916, they were told the following information, and that's written on this, um, on this purchase, purchase ledger card as well. It says, um, designed by Philippe de La Salle, silk weaver to Marie Antoinette, 18th century, French. However, later research has shown that um, these are not by Philippe de La Salle. They do not have a direct connection with Marie Antoinette, and most likely they are Italian, not French. So, um, you know, did Deering and Chalfin believe the dealer when they purchased these silks? Uh, did they want to believe them, believe him? Uh, but then the question is, you know, does it really matter? It makes for great storytelling. And it's, uh, that's what Fiskai is about. We're moving on to the living room. Um, in the left image, you see a, a welter pipe organ. Now, at the time, um, every house of this caliber was supposed to have a pipe organ. So Fiskaya also has a pipe organ. And uh, it is installed in a sort of um, altar surround. And in the center, you see a Neapolitan painting that uh, Chalfin cut it in two. So it could be opened to uh, expose the inner, the inner parts, the, the pipes of the organ, and to let the sound come out. In the right, uh, right image, you see this massive 16th century a fireplace that they purchased from a, a country home in, um, in Normandy, France. Um, it's made of canned stone, a type of marble. However, the top part, the top layer, is, uh, was designed and made by Chalfin, and it's made, made out of plaster. So this is, uh, this is another example of Chalfin's uh, genius of, of putting things together. As we go on, we pass through the uh, East Loggia. This is a, a very airy space. It looks out over the uh, waters of Biscayne Bay. And um, in the illustration in the top right, that is from the uh, Big Bosses uh, manuscript. These illustrations were uh, made by the architect Phineas Paste. He was... Um, uh, a friend of um, Althea, Althea Altimus, and uh, he was involved at Vizcaya towards the end in some of the um, designs also for the village. And he also played a major role in um, the design of the city of Coral Gables in the 1920s. But anyway, um, what you see in this illustration is the artist John Singer Sargent working on the portrait of James Deering that you see below there. Um, John Singer Sargent was a close friend of Charles Deering, James's brother. Uh, he had an estate, Charles had an estate um, several miles south of Vizcaya. 
And as John Singer Sargent was visiting with Charles, he came up to Vizcaya, spent some time there. He created this portrait. He also created some beautiful uh, watercolors. Um, unfortunately, none of those are in the collection of Vizcaya. But uh, Altimus writes about this episode where Sargent is making this portrait. And uh, she writes that he worked on it for a long time uh, and it was to be cherished through the generations. But it's interesting to, say, to see that uh, she writes that she didn't care for it at all. Um, we move on to the dining room. In this space, high up on the wall, there are these two beautiful tapestries. They, they, they tell the story of Mercury. Um, these are these Ferrara uh, tapestries were made by um, silk weavers, uh, either in Brussels or in Italy, uh, Flemish weavers. Um, and uh, they were in the possession of um, Robert and Elizabeth Bar Barrett Browning, the, uh, the poet and his wife. And they were on display in their house in Asolo, Italy until their death, uh, at which point the contents of the house was uh, auctioned off. Um, as we go upstairs, um, we make a brief stop in Cathay, uh, one of the guest bedrooms. Uh, this is decorated in chinoiserie, um, a 17th uh, and 18th century European interpretation of uh, Chinese um, art and style. Uh, Chalfin named this room Cathay in reference to uh, the name for China that was uh, in use for some time in the 18th century. As we move on to Deering's bedroom um, in the um, French Empire style, we see this bed here. This is um, late 19th century Napoleonic style. And according to Chalfin, the bed had belonged to Maria Luisa, the second wife of Napoleon. Um, now, there's not really any evidence that that's actually true. But again, you know, does it matter? It makes for a great storytelling. <laughs> and um, let's have a look at the floor plans of the house. You see on the left, the ground floor, the right, the second floor. Um, and we went through uh, clockwise the entrance loggia, reception room, living room, east loggia, dining room. And upstairs we had a look at the uh, guest room B, which was later named um, uh, Cafe and then Mr. Deering's bedroom. And in the center you see the, the inner court or the courtyard, a almost square space open to the elements. And uh, in the next image, you kind of see how this works. So on the um, ground floor, you, all the rooms are centered around this courtyard. And on the ground floor, the rooms open to um, a colonnaded arc arcades, which then opens to the courtyard. And on the second floor, the rooms open to this colonnaded, these what they call galleries, also open to the courtyard. You see that in, in the top right photo very well. So um, the courtyard was open to the elements um, until the 1980s, when the first skylight of uh, glass and steel was put up. And the one that you see here was put up in 2013. But um, the idea was when it was open to the elements between the courtyard and the loggias that, that gave this, this grand views of either the gardens or the Biscayne Bay, the idea was to have this, this connectedness between inside and outside. And then with all this vegetation inside the courtyard, that, that really enhanced all, also this sense of uh, inside, outside being a, a continuation. And with that, let's go outside to the gardens. Uh, this is a great 
image uh, to kind of show what the estate looked like. This was painted in the 1950s, but what it shows is the estate pre-1926. In 1926, the big hurricane of Miami struck. There was a lot of damage to the city of Miami, also to Vizcaya. But what you see here is the main house, and the formal gardens, which I will show some more about. Uh, there was the mangrove shoreline here, the uh, a hardwood hammock, um, a native forest. that kind of provided a buffer between what would become South Miami Avenue, which today is a major thoroughfare, and the house. So it provided a certain privacy to Mr. Deering. And here you had a uh, farm village that, um, that served to, to support the estate. And then um, here is a boathouse. Um, Deering was um, an enthusiastic boater. He owned several boats. And then here, this large part of the property, that was the uh, was called the Lagoon Gardens. And uh, there were th these lakes and waterways and islands and some, some uh, causeways, some roads. This, this could be navigated by um, a gondola or an other boat. Um, now, the idea was that as opposed to the formal gardens right in front of the house, these were kind of the, the wild gardens, um, but only to, so, to some point, because really this was highly designed as well, and it was all natural made. But let's have um, a look at the, uh, the formal gardens close to the house. Uh, this aerial view is from, I believe, last year. And um, you see the same, part of the same design in this image. This is looking north towards the house. And uh, yes, that's the uh, Miami skyline behind the house. Um, the inset, the black and white photograph shows some of how the gardens were uh, constructed. Um, really, when wherever there's water, it means that they dug. Uh, basins and wherever there's an elevation it means that they uh, gullet dirt and soil and uh, put retaining walls around it really everything in the garden is um, man-made the uh, um, one of the favorite my, my favorite gardens is the secret garden this was originally called the uh, orchid garden because the idea was to grow orchids in these um, limestone wall pockets. Uh, but this being so close to the, to the uh, waters of Biscayne Bay, the salt air and the wind just, the, the orchids didn't grow. So pretty much from the beginning, uh, they were growing other things in this garden. Here you see several different views of the gardens. Um, the bottom right image, this, there's a um, sculpture of winter. Um, there is a, a large collection of 18th century sculpt, marble sculptures from the Veneto region also, uh, allegorical figures, the seasons, uh, various gods. And then there's also in the uh, le lower left image, there's a lot of sculptural elements that were carved on site out of uh, locally quarried limestone. Um, there are many grotesques in uh, like this in different parts of the um, of the gardens. Now, this photo I'm showing. This is um, it is uh, pre 1986 because the house does not yet have the um, the skylight on the on the courtyard. But you see the uh, the, the formal gardens, um, the hardwood uh, hammock, the native forest, and then here. This is what I really want to show this uh, breakwater. This was inspired by a, a similar construction at um, Isola Bella in uh, Lago Maggiore in Italy. Um, it serves as a breakwater. It's also a folly in the gardens, in the waters at Vizcaya. And the, these images show better what it was like. Um, there were fountains on it, um, a lot of vegetation. There was a... Um, 
a summer house, like a, a lettuce, uh, a lettuce little pavilion. Now, most of that was uh, destroyed uh, during the 1926 hurricane. But then there was also this um, um, an extensive sculptural program by the Amer American artist um, Alexander Sterling Calder. And um, yes, there has been damage uh, during various storms, but these sculptures are still up and standing there. And the barge is, uh, the barge is, as it's called, is probably the uh, most iconic element of, uh, of Vizcaya, the most photographed. Uh, one more garden I want to show here is the fountain garden. Originally, this was called the uh, rose garden. And um, in a similar way as orchids didn't really grow in the secret garden, roses at the time didn't grow in this garden. So um, originally a rose garden, it became the fountain garden. But uh, a few years ago, we started to reintroduce roses and um, it's, um, it, it's working. So the central element of this garden is the so-called Sutri fountain. It's, um, it's originally from the central piazza in the town of Sutri, just north of Rome. It was designed by uh, Filippo Barigione in the early 18th century as part of public works commissioned by the papal government. So um, it was dismantled, and, and you see here in the black and white image um, how, how it was situated in this central piazza. But it was uh, dismantled in the early 19th century to make room for um, vehicular traffic. As you see, it's pretty tight in that, in that little piazza. But also at that time, they were installing um, municipal uh, water so uh, the fountain was no longer needed as a uh, source of um, drinking water. So uh, it was dismantled. It ended up with the dealer Simonetti in Rome, and that's where uh, Deering and Chalfin purchased the fountain. They, uh, it was uh, in pieces. It was uh, transported to Vizcaya and reassembled in 1920 in the Rose or in the Fountain Garden. So before completing this tour, I, uh, I have briefly mentioned already the, uh, the farm village, uh, but um, a little bit more about this. So when Deering and Chalfin were traveling in Northern Italy, they encountered these uh, large estates that included both a villa and a farm village to support the, uh, the estate. So that inspired them to uh, create something similar at Vizcaya. So um, there are buildings, and they still exist, these buildings. Um, the garage for um, Deering's Model T Fords. There was the blacksmith shop, um, mechanic shop, a dairy barn, mule barn. There were agricultural fields, greenhouses, orchards. And uh, it was really uh, with the idea that, the, that the, the farm village would support the estate. That's how Deering had intended it. And we are in the process of uh, restoring the buildings to make them uh, part of the operation of Vizcaya and make them accessible to the public again. So... Um, on a final note, uh, James Deering died on board of the SS city of Paris, en route from Paris to uh, New York. This was in 1925. Um, his two nieces, daughters of his brother Charles, inherited the estate and uh, together with their husbands, they maintained it until um, in the late 1940s, they sold parts of the 180 acres and then in 1952, they uh, conveyed the remaining 50 acres to Miami-Dade County on the condition that the county continue to operate it as a, or start to operate it as a public museum. Uh, and this conveyance included the main house, the collections, the formal gardens, and the farm village also. 
So today, Vizcaya is uh, owned by Miami-Dade County and it is operated by uh, the Vizcaya Museum and Gardens Trust, Inc., a nonprofit. Now, as you can imagine, we have our challenges. Um, it takes um, um, it takes some work to maintain this estate, which is over 100 years old, uh, to preserve the collections. And uh, at any given time, we have uh, one or more capital projects going on. Now, also being located on right on the shores of Biscayne Bay, we are dealing with um, increasing impacts of climate change and sea level rise. But at the same time, um, we, uh, we also have the exciting opportunity to continue to share the Vizcaya experience with um, some 300,000 visitors per year in person. And now we have also these, of course, these uh, virtual experiences like this evening. So with that, I am going to conclude with a quote again from um, Witold Rybczynski. When he writes about Chalfin, and I quote, Chalfin did not want merely to decorate the rooms. He wanted to orchestrate them. As one walked through the house, one would move from geographic locale to geographic locale, from century to century, from mood to mood, end of quote. And um, I think, in, in my opinion, this is really part what, what, of what makes Vizcaya so fascinating and so unusual and really so much fun. So thank you. Thank you so much. I was mesmerized. It was amazing. Uh, thank you. So. Last week, we asked the virtual viewers for their questions first. So this week, I'm going to ask the live watch party if anyone has a question. Yes. Yes, you can be heard. I'll repeat it, too. Uh, has the, have the beautiful rooms, especially the main rooms of the house, have they always been maintained in such pristine condition, or at one point were significant restorations required? Were you able to hear him, or should I repeat it? Well, you repeat it anyway. Have the rooms always been maintained in such pristine condition or have they been renovated, renovated more recently? Well, so um, I don't know how messy James Deering himself was. So about that period, I don't really know. But after that, um, the, his nieces inherited the house and um, they did not live there. They occasionally stay there, but from what I understand, most of the um, the art furnishings, the carpets, the textiles, they were wrapped up until uh, 1952 when it was conveyed to the county and it became a public museum. And um, since then, it has been maintained well somewhat pristine, yes, but of course there have been changes because we've had to make room for visitor traffic. Uh, and also, well, we've had our shares of, of, of hurricanes and damage inside the house, so things have changed. However, I have to say that um, unlike many other estates, the, the Fiscaya overall is pretty intact between the house and the formal gardens, um, the collections, the furnishings in the house, the archives. So. Um, it, Largely speaking, it is how it used to be during Deering's time. Yeah. Any other watch party? Ah, oh, yes. Um, what does the name mean? What does the name Vizcaya mean? Thank you. I was waiting for that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Debbie pointed that out last week that um, that this this would come up. So, uh, and I saved it on purpose because it so uh, wraps up so well what, what Vizcaya is about. So um, Vizcaya, on the, first of all, there, there was an explorer called Vizcaino and um, he, he actually never made it to Florida. He went to California, but that's, that's one reference. <laughs> um, 
the second reference is that there is a, a province in Spain called Biscaya. It's part of Basque country. So there is a reference there also. And then there is, of course, Biscayne Bay right, right on the, um, along the, the shores at Biscaya. And um, it also apparently means something like an elevated place in, in Basque language. But what's interesting, and um, can I still share my screen? Yes, you can, go ahead. Um, as I said, I was expecting this uh, question. You didn't, oh, there it goes. Yeah? Yes, you're good. So, so this is a letter uh, from Deering to Chalfin where he addresses just this topic. It's uh, uh, April 7, 1914. But uh, he mentions all these different things, these, these, these different reasons, but he ends the letter with this story about Vizcaino, for example. I doubt the authenticity, but it is a good story just the same. I doubt <laughs> if we are likely to get a better name. <laughs> so, so you know, I think that really kind of summarizes the entire their approach of creating this guy. It's all about storytelling and it's all about myth making. That is awesome. I love, I love that. Um, I have questions from the virtual Zoom world. Uh, are the king tides damaging the house? <laughs> Um, yes. King tides damaging the house. Yes. So there's a uh, high tide for, for um, there's high tide and there's king tide, especially high. So uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, the barge is especially vulnerable. It was created as a breakwater. It's doing its job, but uh, there has been a damage to the barge, but also the groundwater is getting higher. So um Yes, Vizcaya has a basement, uh, believe it or not, and uh, there is water intrusion there. So altogether, between king tides, rising tides, and hurricanes, yes, there, there is a definite um, impact on Vizcaya. Uh, another question. Is Charles' house still standing? Where in Miami was it? Yes, it is still standing. It's about 10 miles south of Vizcaya. It's called the, uh, the Deering Estate at Cutler. Uh, it, um, it became, it was, uh, Charles Deering died in 1927, and the family owned that house until the 1980s when it was sold to the state, the state or the county also. And now it is part of Park and Recreation of Miami-Dade County and it is open to the public, yeah. How many servants were there in Deering's time? Oh gosh, um, many. <laughs> So Deering stayed at, uh, at the estate only during the winter months, which was about November to April. And th at that time, there was a, an army of, uh, of, of staff to do everything. And um, um, I, I don't know the number, but one good example to illustrate how many there were is... Um, you know, now in the decorated room, uh, rooms, we keep the curtains closed because of sun and, and different reasons. But back then, um, when the sun rose on one side of the house, the, the curtains would be closed and then servants would uh, close all the curtains as the sun went around the house. Well, at that time, there was enough staff for that. But uh, today, that just isn't the case anymore. There were many servants and there was this whole hierarchy of staff. Um, have, maybe you've been, uh, you've watched, um, what's the English series? Mountain Abbey. Mountain Abbey and the current American series, The Gilded Age. The Gilded Age. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's, it gives a wonderful impression of, uh, of how it must have been at the time. Thank you. Um, uh, we have a person who said, I recently visited Vizcaya and thought it beautiful. I love the East Loggia and the barge. I also love the palm fabric on the walls in the reception room. Question mark, is it? Fabric, I guess, is what she's asking. Is the, is the, are the walls in the reception room palm fabric? Are they fabric? Yes. No, no, it's not. It's silk. It's silk. 
And um, you know, I mentioned uh, that in 1966, um, new silk wall panels, replicas, were installed. Uh, they were made by the firm Scalamandra. And the reason is that uh, silk is it's what they call inherent vice. It is deteriorating uh, really no matter how, what the environment is. Silk is deteriorating. And um, when you see the current silks, the replicas, they also have faded. And that just happens. But it's uh, it's not made of palm. It's it's made of uh, of silk. Yeah, woven. Um, do we have any other questions here? But um, I assume that modern humidity and modern HVAC have been installed in the house in the last few decades. Have modern um, HVAC and especially humidity. humidifier dehumidifiers been installed? Oh yes. Okay. Uh, so in in the mid 80s this skylight was installed the first version of that and that was really to control the environment inside the house and along with that hvac was installed um there was a price to pay for that because uh, many of the um uh, closets and bathrooms were uh, converted to house the mechanicals for this system um, now, of course, that 1986, how that's, uh, it's more than 30 years old, and we have started to replace the, uh, the system, uh, but it's quite a, a, quite a job, and it's, uh, it's not easy to maintain a good environment in the house. And the final question for tonight is um, about the stash of rum. Is there any left? <laughs> <laughs> there is. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you mean at the bar in, in, in your in your room there or <laughs> I think they meant Vizcaya, but just okay. checking. Yes, yes. There, the original liquor or whatever during left is still there. Uh, we know that it was rebottled, recoupered in the 60s, I believe. So it's not the original bottles and the labels are replicas also. But when you look at the bottles and the contents, I don't think I would want to drink that. <laughs> but it's, it's there. It's there. Yes. <laughs> I think that's a great note to end on. And thank you so very much. Pleasure. You'll we'll all get um, information on how to visit Vizcaya and a recording of this as well. And again, this is our finale for our series. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit, next year is our fifth year, our fifth anniversary. And for our fifth anniversary, we are going to do the People's Choice. So if you have any place you wish you could go, please let me know and we will select four of the most popular for the People's Choice next year. So stay tuned, but this was amazing. We might have to have a Skya back. I don't know, this was wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much again. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.